I am an African American that has met the highest mark within the fire department at the city of Spartanburg, not on my own merit, but on the blood and on the guts and on the steps of those who come before me. I began my, uh, really my first career was in the Highland community as a young executive running the Bethlehem Center. I was drafted to the Detroit Lions in 2008 in the seventh round. My career was an automotive industry career and it was really a unique one. I uh, graduated from Wofford in 1971. I uh, attended Wofford College uh, earning a, a, a BS degree in, in math and physics and then I went down to the University of South Carolina with a master's degree in physics. I went to the Ailey School in New York from um, 2005 until 2008. Well, I'm the first African American to get a PhD in computer science from the uh, University of South Carolina Computer Science Department. I worked for a company called Reeves Brothers and that was a textile company. But I didn't go in the textile inside. I mean, I went in the aerospace side of it. And then in 2015, um, I came back here. Um, I got a job at Carver Middle School where I teach dance to amazing, amazing little young dancers. I went to Vanderbilt University, got a full scholarship, stayed there for three years. I got drafted in the fourth round by the Chicago Bears and then played four years there and then I played a year uh, with the Panthers and then uh, with a brief stint with, with the Tampa Bay Bucks. I am an artist. I'm a teaching artist and uh, I've been teaching uh, for, this is my 42nd year. Well, I've been employed at the city of Spartanburg for actually this is my 24th year. I'm now currently a police lieutenant at the city of Spartanburg Police Department. I'm an educator. I am presently a uh, full-time instructor at USC Upstate teaching mathematics. Uh, I've taught in the public school system for many years and I served in several capacities from teaching to administration to supervision. I uh, work in the highway department, Milligan, and for the school. Highland has produced um, great people, uh, people of the medical field, people of the clergy, people of military, um, public service people, uh, athletes. I'm a real estate broker. I ran the pool for a while. And then I worked here at Bethlehem Center for a while. And then I ran the camp that we had, the Bethlehem Center camp up in Rutherford. I've owned four businesses, all medical businesses. And I've started them from scratch, made money, and sold them. I went to school at night for uh, television. And I finished school and I went to, uh, I finally landed a job with uh, NBC. I went to the New England Patriots, then to the Chicago Bears, and then I played in the Super Bowl with the um, Seattle uh, Seahawks. I can't even remember. That's how, you know, unimportant some of that stuff is. I am a college professor. I teach in a department called informatics, but what I teach are computer science courses. I went to work with Michelin, spent uh, t a couple of years in, in France, and now I returning to France. I stayed with Michelin for 38 years. I'm the art coordinator for Spartanburg School District 6, and uh, I also teach at R.P. Dawkins Middle School. I worked to work at USC Spartanburg. I was director of financial aid and director of uh, veterans affairs. And here I am, a young 24-year-old, thinking I'm going to change the world, and I'm in the inner city. I grew up in Packlet, so you know, growing up in rural Packlet, South Carolina, coming into Highland was like a big deal. Now, I was a young guy, probably 20-something years old, 27, black, and, and, and the job that I had, I knew then it wasn't supposed to be a young black man's job, because I was suit and tie. And, and flying everywhere and, and doing all this. My greatest accomplishment is I helped develop something that nobody wants to see and they call it the escape slide. Uh, every slide in the world have my signature on it at the bottom. So that's something that I'm very proud of. I was nosy, I, what make that work? What, what you doing there? Why, why, what, what make this do this? And, and so they saw that I was interested, so they trained me. One day I saw this ad in the paper that said, how would you like to travel, see the world, make all of this money? I said, dial this number, I dial this number, and it said Allstate Insurance Company. I said, I saw your ad in the paper. They said, can you come in for an interview today? I did, I went in, 
I interviewed, they said, you're hired. I said, this doesn't sound right. We had so many games at, time, some, at times that they, they had to spread us out and finally they had to give me a chance to do camera. So that's what I was waiting for. And then once I started doing camera, I was all over the country. Well, right now I'm Chief Operating Officer for the Spartanburg County Foundation. I left the Bethlehem Center um, in 1998 and I joined the foundation then as a senior program officer. I now own, own my own dance studio called AVK Dance Studio. When uh, uh, Scully put that plane in the Hudson, though if you look at the picture, the plane is staying afloat on something silver looking. That's a slide. You know, I'm from Spartanburg, so Stephen Davis is everyone's cousin. He was like the first guy to ever do it. So if you lived anywhere in Spartanburg, Stephen Davis was your cousin. Steve, you know, Steve played for the Carolina Panthers. He played for the Washington Redskins. The first football team I played on was the Bethlehem Center Chargers. And um, it was it was a problem. It was, it was great times, man. I never had a bad experience here. Uh, he kind of kicked the door open and said, hey, guys, somebody from the neighborhood can come and make it. Uh, one, my first football coach was Elmer Brown. Yeah, Elmer, yeah, basketball, we, everybody played for him. I coached Steve Davis um, with my son, that was early. Uh, he was very young. Took a lot of kids from the neighborhood, taught us how to play football, taught us how to be teammates. Uh, and it started with him. We got together and uh, we formed teams here in the neighborhood in Highland Community. He was a guy that took the time out of his, out of his life and teach uh, young kids sports. It was, a, it was actually kind of impressive what he did because he used to get kids from like rival neighborhoods to play basketball together. It was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. He was one of my first coaches. And, if it wasn't for him, I probably would never play football. I always wonder, like, how do you get these kids to normally just fight each other and shoot at each other all week to play basketball together? And somehow, you know, Elmer used to, he used to do it. Um, i never forget <laughs> and when we played in that first football game with my age group of guys. And uh, we never played organized football before, you know. Very first play of the game. And uh, I think we was playing... Uh, North Spartanburg or somebody, and um, everybody went out for a pass, including the center, the offensive lineman, and everybody. <laughs> and you know, we, we sit back and laugh about it today, but to come from that to winning championships, it was it was a great feeling. I was uh, inducted in the South Carolina Hall of Fame. He made sure he got them off the street and got them on the basketball court. I never was the person that wanted to come back to Spartanburg because I didn't feel like there was anything for me here. I didn't feel like Spartanburg was a place where I could grow and flourish, but I'm seeing that that is not true, especially now. Yeah, there are so many successful people. Just from my knowledge, I can think of a principal, I can think of a county, I can think of lawyer, athletically. Everybody knows Peelhead, you know, Tim Hosley and he went on to have a stellar career. His name is Peelhead. Tim Hosley. Uh, he played baseball. Yeah, Timothy Hosley, yeah, we called uh, call him Peelhead. He could hit a softball a mile. He's, he was from Highland. He played uh, baseball for the Oakland A's and also for the Detroit Tigers. Like I say, I tell a lot of people this, I wasn't the best athlete to come out of Highland. I was just a, one of the fortunate ones. Yeah, I remember a guy, and anybody who's my age will remember this, there's an old guy who used to uh, play a guitar, riding up, walk up and down the street. His name was Pink Anderson. Yeah, oh yeah, Pink would drive you up a wall, so, Pink Anderson. And I always tell um, students, I, you know, I was not born with a golden spoon in my mouth but I was born with a golden opportunity. When we were here, it was like a striver's row. You were here until you could do better, and then you moved on. We used to have a saying, and the saying was, everybody in Spotburg lived in Highland at some point in time until they could do better. Uh, there are a lot of things that happened, uh, a lot of 
a lot of negative things that happened in the area that uh, created a bad look for Highland. People sometimes look down on people from Highland or the Highland community. I used to tell people, they said, oh, you, you from Highland? I said, yes. I'm proud where I come from. I did not realize that I was poor <laughs> until I left Highland. I mean, until I, I started going to a school out of the area because er everybody in Highland looked out for each other and everybody seemed equal. When you first move to Highland, you're going to get jumped on. This is it. There's just no question about it. You're going to get jumped on. I don't know what the reason behind it is. You know, growing up in Highland, I think Highland prepared me um, how to cope, uh, how to deal with, with adversity. Honestly, just growing up in a neighborhood like Highland and seeing how tough you had to be and th thinking that you're tough and realizing that you wasn't tough as you needed to be. The kids, you knew when you were coming to Highland, the kids were, were going to be tough. Um, and I can remember like yesterday, we riding bikes or something, and all of a sudden about 15 kids pop up out of nowhere and they just jumping on you for no reason at all. And it was just part of what Highland was, and you could you could either stay in the house and be scared of it or go outside and play basketball. It's, it's almost a, a culture that we have here in Spartanburg. So no matter where you go, you are prepared and have been through things in your life that are, that's going to take you to the next level if you use them properly. The, the pride of just being black was something back then in Highland. We were, we were poor, but we were very proud people, and we were very determined people. There was a pivotal moment where I had a conversation with myself where I had to believe that I could dance. Even though I've been training my whole life, it was like, can I really do this? Like, can I really book a job? Can I really have a career as a dancer? All we thought about was getting out of here and, 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 and doing better with ourselves and our lives. So we could come back and tell everybody how great, great we'd become, how, how well we'd done. So I wouldn't trade my history or my past because there was a lot of valuable lessons that I learned living in Highland. There was a lot of good people that I met we got so many role models and they did not, they refused to let us, to let us slip through the cracks. The Bethlehem Summit, that, that did set the foundation of me um, having a, a little bit more of a rising over my social skills and everything. So that set the foundation of me growing uh, to who I am today. We didn't have a lot of money. I think at the time the budget was about $85,000. So we began reaching out into the community. I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know, so we just started trying things. Bethlehem Center created the first educational piece to, to where I'm at now. Uh, Bethlehem Center was a place where we played, I played a lot of basketball. And we had a lot of arts and crafts for the, for the young folks, the kids. We used to do a lot of things here at this area. This was a starting point for a lot of us in the Highland area, right here at the Bethlehem Center. And like I said, they walked back in this building and brought back a whole lot of members. I would come with my father. Um, my mother and my father both worked jobs, full-time jobs, and they would drop me off here um, at the Bethlehem Center where I would stay all day until my parents got off. I mean, I went to kindergarten at Bethlehem Center, so I was in the Bethlehem Center every day, even up until junior high school. Well, I will say the first week that I started at the Bethlehem Center, the kids rocked my car. I'm like, oh my God, what is this all about? And so we spent those early days down at DJJ, taking the kids to court. So I'm like, well, you know what? If we let them in and give them something to do, maybe they'll stop vandalizing and, and tearing up things. And so that's what we did. Being kids, we did some mischievous things, but we, we always had the center to fall back on, and it was great for the community. As a young kid, um, like sometimes, especially in the summertime, you have much to eat. Uh, you know, you can always go to the Bethlehem Center and get the little uh, hoagie sandwich. They always gave you the hoagies, and they was passing them out to everybody and being able to come down here and play basketball. When I come on this side of the table and, you know, we have the opportunity to do things in a much broader way, in a much more impactful way, I have an understanding of what it means to be in the trenches. I have an understanding uh, of what it means to, to be hand to mouth, if you will, because at the Bethlehem Center, we worked hard. And we would go downtown. Once we got old enough, teenagers would go downtown. But um, we had everything we needed here. So we really didn't have to leave 
our community uh, un unless you just wanted to go downtown and buy something. And uh, when you did, that was at the time that you were subjected to the, uh, to the segregation. I remember walking to the back of the bus and there was a rope and a line where blacks had to be and whites sit. And if there were too many whites, they moved the line and blacks had to move further back. And, and no one, thank God, knows that or remembers that. And, and that's good. That's a good thing for us as a people. But I remember it. Going to Warford was the very first time that I was uh, exposed to white folks on a, on a big scale. <laughs> and uh, it, that in and of itself was challenging. But like I said, I had some survival skills. We got duped and, and, and we sold out. And our urban renewal come through and it wiped us out. They tore down everyone's homes and built Cammy Claggett. That means they took away all of the businesses. One of the things about Spottenberg was always interesting to me is that with all the things that were going on racially in, in this country, I never sensed that in, in Spottenberg. People see, this world see us as uneducated, not able to communicate, uh, lazy, slow, uh, uh, penniless. Prove them wrong. Get education. Education is the foundation. Our teachers had told us that all white kids were smart, uh, that we had uh, that we were behind and, and needed to work extra hard to catch up. And I'm glad they instilled that in us. But one of the things that I found when I went to Warford <laughs> was all white folks ain't smart. <laughs> I think we've been lulled into thinking that everything is even and you you on an even playing ground, which you're not. Even when I got the award for uh, the slides that we used at, uh, on the Hudson and the person in the ambassador of France came uh, to give us the award, uh, he was kind of uh, amazed that most of the people that work for me are black. If people would show respect for folks, I think respect would be given back. I was going to college. I had been accepted. I had sent my uh, deposit, key deposit and everything. But back then with money and stuff, when time came to go, it, we just couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford it. It's not just your life that's, that, that's hard. It's everybody's life. Um, and I can tell you that my older brother was, he used to sell drugs and got killed when he was 25. I had to bury him. Uh, my younger brother's in jail right now doing 30 years for attempted murder. When I was in high school, my, my sister did nine years from armed robbery. Uh, my mom, you know, struggled with crack cocaine to this day, and I had to deal with that when I was in high school. My uh, father uh, abandoned my mother when she was, uh, was pregnant with me, so I, uh, I, I grew up not uh, knowing my father and my mother, you know, struggling to try to raise six children. And the first time I actually uh, uh, saw my daddy was actually when I was 12 years old. I was told my daughter, if you don't get your life straight, you're going to be in jail or dead. Because the life she was living, hey, at any time, her bell was going to toll. I ended up injuring my ankle and my hip at... Um, I think 26, my hip was just like, no thank you anymore, <laughs> you're done. And it's hard for young kids to realize this, this is up to you. It's not my parents did this, so I should do it. No, it's up to you uh, and everybody, a lot of people go through that situation and it's up to you if you want to get yourself out of it. It takes hard work and you cannot wallow in your, in your surroundings. You want to do better. You cannot be a part of a generational curse. You've got to decide, this is what I want to do. And you can do what you want to do if you strive to do it. 90% of, of things that happens to you is going to happen anyway, but it's the 10% is what, how you react to what happens to you. One of the things was my mother, mm -hmm. uh, the strength that she had, being a, mm -hmm. a single uh, mother, raising five kids on her own, uh, having breast cancer. Uh, surviving for 20 years, 23 years for that, from that. And uh, she's my biggest influence. Whatever God has for me is for me. 
And that's the way I feel about it. So I accept it. Sometimes you look back and you think about uh, what could have happened or what you missed out on. But had that happened, then maybe this hadn't happened. What turned into like a temporary thing due to being injured became permanent. And then um, I met my husband. While I was at the Bethlehem Center, I was sent to Zaire. Um, the General Board of Global Ministries um, sent me to Zaire in 1995 after the Rwandan War. Here, yes, we have poverty, but we have resources. We have infrastructure. Um, there, there was no infrastructure. There was no Salvation Army or the American Red Cross or the Bethlehem Center. I think the saving grace for us now is going to be uh, economics. Uh, we, we, we went through uh, this era for uh, marching and protesting and things of that nature. For the time that it happened, it was effective, it was good. But I don't think that it's effective anymore. So when I came back to um, Spartanburg after that experience, it took me a while to kind of uh, decompress. I was not patient with people who were complaining. I was not patient with people who uh, were, were ungrateful. We have enough wealth among black people, but we just don't have the knowledge how to manage that wealth. That, that's, that's the problem we, we got. When you arrive or you better yourself and you have the opportunity, always reach back and always bring somebody with you. I had teachers who inspire me and um, my goal is to be the same inspiration, if not, you know, to be even greater because that's always a task of a great leader. In order to be successful, you got to go to work. You got to pull your sleeves up and go to work. So if people tell you what you can't do, just look him in the eye. I'm going to tell you what I can do. You know, those naysayers that's sitting on the fence are going to have to get off the fence and become positive about what's going on and make this thing happen, make everything happen in a positive manner. The moment I made a decision to really just not be limited mentally um, was, was like a eureka moment. It was like, I'm the only person um, who is responsible for my success and my failure. I, I think sometimes we, uh, we have a can't-do attitude and uh, we say it's too hard, but nothing is too hard when you put your mind to it. I was in my room one day and I wrote down, I can dance and I will dance. The man who can is the man who thinks he can. So it starts with an attitude. They used to have a saying, if you think you're a beat, you are. If you think you dare not, then you won't. My greatest success is, and um, I tell everybody this, it's not disappointing my family. My proudest moments happen with my interaction with the kids. Um, when they use manners, like when they refer to me as Miss Kennedy and they say hello. Uh, my greatest success, more probably going into business, going into business for myself. Going up in the ranks of the police department, and I started off as a regular patrol officer and then um, building, uh, going up the ranks to sergeant and now lieutenant. And, but however, you know, that's a self-accomplishment. Uh, what I like is doing my time is the uh, amount of times I was able to help people that needed help. So as long as uh, there's an airplane flying, my slides will be on that plane. You know, the h and Block for the last 10, 15 years, has been asking me to sell to him. I said, this little black boy from Highland has done this. You know, being in philanthropy, um, you can kind of get lost, you know, in the resources you have and the influence and all of that. But my days at the Bethlehem Center has kept me humble. As a firefighter, as an assistant chief, I'm in a high profile position to make decisions. But my position I can't do anything without the foundation of my firefighters. Well, if, if, if you're a kid, and if you're eight, nine, 10 years old, and if you see these crack vials and you see the little boy on a bicycle riding around and he's your lookout, before you get to school, what are you gonna be thinking about? You gonna be thinking about school? You gonna be thinking about how you can make a dollar? It can be really, 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 really challenging to inspire people 
um, because you have to get past their own will. A lot of times they always say, well, well, where are the parents? Like, well, it ain't the parents. The parents will raise you good, but once you get out there in them streets and and somebody else influence you to do something, it's hard to have those kids to come back to you. I think that the mindset and the knowledge that we have, we need to share this knowledge with these young people. See, because uh, I can see that a lot of them, they just don't have the drive. They, they actually feel like they're already defeated. I have to get through their situations. I gotta get through what happened before they came. You know, some kids are homeless, some kids are hungry. Some kids have been taking a bath and they're like, well, I don't really care about a career right now. Like I'm cold, I was cold last night. Without the education, they're gonna be stuck in section eight or section, if they don't, if they, and, and they get so comfortable with this. You have a decision to make. As to whether or not you're going to use those circumstances and go on and to be successful, work hard and be successful, or are you going to use those circumstances as an excuse uh, to be a failure? We've all been dealt a particular hand, and so I talked to them about what can they do with the particular cards that they've been dealt. I used to, I would go party with my friends for sure, but I did my work before I went to the party. By the time we got to the bamboo room, it was about 7.30. And I would stand there for about 30 minutes with the guys and make my appearance, as they say today. Then I'd go home and do my homework. And by 10 or 11, I was, I was in the bed. So at the end of uh, six weeks, I'd have, have my grades, and I usually had all A's and one B, right? There are things that you're going to have to do. Your buddies might be doing certain things. You're going to have to say, you know what? I might do those certain things, but I'm going to do what I need to do beforehand. So we hold ourselves back. Um, and even though there are obstacles there, they're only as powerful as the attention we give to them. I tell all kids, whatever you do in life, try to, be, try to do it for yourself. Nobody else. Try to be successful for yourself. Because if you are happy with yourself and you do everything that you possibly can with yourself, you'll be successful. Um, I know it's a lot of temptations out there, a lot of things that try to, try to because the devil is always working. And you just got to go out and do the things you're capable of doing. I would love for the young people to really stay focused in school, first of all, in, 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 in high school, get focused and, 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 and get and, and determined to decide what they want to do and stick to it and go for it. Think about what you could do and not and less about what others think of you. I've never taught school before. I've never on my own dance studio, but I've learned that when you dance with fear, you take its power away. My theory was when I was in school, if they can do it, I can do it. And uh, that's the way I approach that. Nothing too hard. If it's hard for them, it's got to be hard for me. But if they can do it, I can do it too. What uh, I would tell our youth today is to uh, have vision. You know, have vision in what you want to do. Uh, we were taught to obey the laws. We were taught to go to school. You can't lose. Do your work. Strive for better, but most of all, excel in school because that's the only way you're going to get to the next level. You have to excel in school. There is no reason in the world now for no one to not be educated. I would encourage them to not stop, to keep going, and to not let anybody stop them because they may not come from a good neighborhood. Don't carry that baggage. A lot of times today, you know, it's stacked against you, but you just gotta, you know, keep keep, keep striving. You can't give up. Um, I mean, things are gonna happen. It's gonna happen. The rich, poor, I can I can tell you, it's gonna happen to everybody. You just have to just keep pushing. And if you if you stop pushing, uh, I promise you, you won't succeed. Find you a good mentor. Don't give up. Seek advice and learn how not to talk, but to listen. Look at you know who you uh, associate with. Make sure there are positive people around you. Uh, stay focused and um, reach your goals. You have to figure out how to coexist. You have to figure out how to learn how to love. You got to figure out how to share. You have to figure out all of those things when you're from, um, you know, uh, a neighborhood like Highland, which is, uh, which is okay. Everybody, that if it's free, you look at what's what's behind it because it's catch to it. It's either going to enable you. And that's, that's wrong. You need to be your own man instead of your own boots. How do you be a woman? I'm trying to be an example of a woman. And that's not always being like super pretty or 
um, docile, but rather, you know, woman can be strong, you can be a leader, um, you can take charge. You get you a do a career, not just a job. Don't look for just a paycheck, mm -hmm. get a career that will take you a lot further than where you're at now. A job is just somewhere you go to school, go to work, get a paycheck, and come back home and then you don't care about what you do, you just want the paycheck. A career is something you invest in, your time, your talent, and, and your money. Do everything you possibly can not to fail. And that's in school and in the activities that you're doing, uh, in life, period. Every person has a creative genius or an idea that um, they can just step out and try. So the, the young folk, especially the ones who grew up in Highland, they should never use the fact that uh, they, grew up, they grew up in Highland to explain why they are not successful. Never forget where you came from. Always remember the past. Always remember that who much is given, much is required. And always make your dreams bigger than your fears. It's not where you come from. It's where you're going. It, it's not where you're at. It's what you do when you're there. Cherish those who invest in not who you are, but what you are, your own being, and the goals in which you have set. What kind of advice I will give? The first thing, you got to have this one. To be able to survive in anything, you almost have to be, you have to be mentally strong um, and be able to hear the word no. I call it getting a cut. You know, you have to get in a cut. You have to discipline yourself. If you give me some hope, that's the key, that, I, that things can be better for me and that I can make it out of here one day, then I'm going to try to be halfway straight. Main thing is don't give up. Um, you know, you may not um, succeed the first time, but don't give up. Mental toughness. It means being able to discipline yourself on, if you got to work seven days straight, being able to work seven days straight because you're tough to do it, not on the six. Oh, I don't feel good, my feet hurt, I'm gonna lay out. Nah, you can't do that. The main thing is you got to have the fortitude. You got to apply yourself, you got to work hard. And uh, when the circumstances uh, uh, present itself for you to uh, take advantage of them, then you need to make sure you're prepared. Open your mind, set you some goals, and try to achieve every goal you set. And I promise you'll, you'll be much better for it. You have to be comfortable with failing and, and not getting defensive because you're gonna make mistakes. So let's learn from it, let's glean from what happened. Never give up. I always think about not what people, well see, people can perceive you as being this and that, but think about yourself. I love you guys, uh, you know, I'm always around, so feel free if you see me in the neighborhood, please come up, give me a hug, talk to me, ask me whatever you need to ask me. And it's all good. You know, as a community, just be, just be friendly, man. Like, just let everybody live, laugh, and be happy. Like, a, a good fist fight ain't never hurt nobody. Let them go home and let them heal up, and you'll be okay. Prayer, faith, perseverance, and not being afraid is what caused the success that we enjoyed. Um, you know, just stepping out there and trying it, you know? Asking people and not being afraid, telling the story. Uh, finding those rising stars in the community and letting, letting them be a part of the journey. So a lot of times people are afraid. They're afraid of success. They're afraid of failure. And I would say fear is just a shadow. It can't do anything to you beyond the power that you give it. And so I would say to dance with it. To keep on pushing. Like Curtis Mayfield say, don't stop now. Move up a little higher, some way, somehow. <laughs>